In this video, I'll be throwing, trimming, attaching and pulling the handles and finally carving them too, to make them far finer than what can possibly be achieved when pulling them in my usual manner. For those who've been following me for a long time over on Instagram, for years even, you'll know that this standard mug I make for a long time has stayed more or less the same. It's a straight cylinder that tapers in ever so much at the top and has a simple pulled handle. I felt it was time for something new. So during my last making cycle, I spent an hour or so throwing 30 different mug bodies and then I attached handles to each of them. They were all quite different. Some I really liked, whilst others weren't nearly so nice. And this form, the one I'll be making in this video, was my favorite of them all, I think so I'll just be making a small batch initially. I weigh this high iron stoneware clay into lumps of approximately 300 grams, or about 10 and a half ounces. Personally, I prefer smaller mugs to drink from. I like them to be delicate and light, as opposed to mugs that are so large, they're practically like tankards. Ultimately, my aim when making pottery is to create objects that I can imagine myself living with and using. That's it. I try not to cater to other people's tastes, as I think it makes for a more particular and individual body of work. Once all the clay has been weighed out, I give each one a quick little wedge, two at a time, with a sort of slap and roll method. This isn't so much to remove any pockets of air that's been done already, rather it just amalgamates all the weighed out pieces. And with this last little lump of clay, I'll throw a circular disc on the wheelhead, which I'll eventually attach MDF bats onto, and it's onto those that I'll throw the mugs. I could use an integrated bat system, or bats that attach via pins on the wheelhead, but this is the method I always fall back to. It's the way I was taught, and some habits are difficult to change. Recently, someone left a comment that asked how I grab the water that I throw with, as my jug of water is usually out of shot, and all I do is create a small ladle shape with my fingers, which is placed into the bucket, and then the contents are dumped out onto the pot. Once the clay bat is wide and thick enough, I tidy the wheel up, and then I flatten the top of the clay, as if this clay bat is wobbling up and down, then the wooden bat placed onto it, will just exaggerate any movement from below. Then, I grab my paint stripper and give it a good blast. And at this point, as the clay is leather hard, it's very easy to trim the surface to be totally flat if it wasn't so before. Then to attach a bat, I just brush the underside with a bit of water, place it on, roughly tap center it into the middle, and then to really hold it in place, I grab both sides and wiggle it in place, pushing both downward and forward. Now, the reason I'm throwing these on bats in the first place is because not only are these pots quite thinly walled, but their initial thrown shape doesn't provide me with much area to grasp and lift the pot away with. It could very well be possible, but in this instance, I'd simply rather not risk it. And by throwing them on a wooden bat, I can simply pry the bat off after they've been thrown and lift that away without ever touching the mug. And in theory, I could make all of my work on bats. But the issue that arises is this. When pots are thrown on a bat, they suddenly become much larger objects to store as they dry. On one wear board, I can fit 10 of these bats, but when I throw my normal mugs without them, I can fit 26 mugs to a wear board. And so much of being a potter is simply managing the space you work in. And so being efficient with the space you have when you're producing hundreds and hundreds of pots is very important as ultimately for me, the largest limit to my output is the space I have to work in. Once the lump of clay has been centered 
by coning it up and moving it around, I use my index finger and thumb to open up the lump, and then with my fingers I can press the base. A bent thumb works for the other side too. All I'm doing here is ensuring that the bottom is nice and flat. Compressing the clay also helps to prevent any cracks from forming in the base. Then I grasp the clay at the base with a knuckle on the outside and the pads of my fingers on the inside. I squeeze them together and then I coax the clay upward. Here I'm doing the exact same thing but on the outside I'm substituting my knuckle for the tip of my index finger which really lets me push the clay in at the base. These are thinly potted pieces so I pull the clay up bit by bit rather than hoisting it all up in two or three pulls. This is also a form I'm relatively new to and it does take time to learn how's best to distribute the clay in the walls, especially when they're pieces with a sharp angle in the waist. I can't let that section get too thin as otherwise the outward angling top section may become unstable. And about now you can see the form in the rough still covered with throwing rings on the outside. And once that's been achieved, I'll start to clean the shape up. It begins by removing some of the excess clay from around the base. Then I sponge out all the excess liquid from inside the form. And for these I didn't use my usual metal kidney. Instead I found a wooden tool which had an edge that fit into the bottom section of this pot exactly. And whilst it may look as if I'm digging the tool into the clay. In actuality, the tool was staying in place and I was pushing the clay out from the inside against the wooden edge. That way it conforms totally to the shape exactly where I wanted. This is compared to if I was pushing the wood into the clay, which would cause these two angles, top and bottom, be pushed inward and thus changing the form quite dramatically. I then take a chamois leather and quickly run it over the sharp rim and then with a flat edge of a kidney I just clean all the slip away from the bat as if you want to keep the bats in the best condition you want to minimize the amount of time they spend soaking wet so by removing any puddles of slip they should walk less the pots then have a wire dragged tightly directly underneath them and then I pry the wooden bat away and attach a new one usually in these videos I don't show much sped up throwing work, but in some instances I think it can be quite useful to see a piece thrown with speed as it very quickly demonstrates just how much change the piece of clay on the wheel undergoes throughout this process. And that's it for the throwing of these. They are, by all accounts, quite simple shapes. And so, the next day, once these pieces have turned totally leather hard, as you can see by the matte surface they now have, as compared to previously, where they glistened as they were still completely wet, and there's no way I'd be able to lift one up like this, just after they've been thrown. To trim these, I use my trusty chuck which, when it's not in use, is wrapped up tightly in plastic, as I want it, ideally, to stay leather hard for as long as possible, as even if they're just slightly tacky, they stick much better to the pots that are placed onto them. I then coat a little bit of slip onto the bottom of the chuck and press it into the centre, again applying downward and forward pressure with each push. The slip underneath dries quickly, which is enough to hold the chuck firmly in the middle of the wheel. I then place a spinner on top. This one was made for me by a man called Richard Carter, a fantastic engineer and potter. I'll leave a link to his Instagram 
in the description below. It has a ball bearing in between the black and white section, so the piece I hold stays still, whereas the white part spins with the pot. And through this, I can apply constant downward pressure, and as the tool is so wide, it distributes that pressure across the entire base of the pot, as opposed to focusing it on one spot, like my fingertips might, which could easily deform the base. Once a rough outer layer of clay has been removed, lightening up the shape and refining it, I then use a flat metal edge just to smooth over any prominent marks left by the turning tools. The surface doesn't need to be perfectly smooth, and in fact that's not what I'm aiming for, as ultimately the glazed veneer that covers this pot will hide many, if not all, of those smaller marks. I then take a finer trimming tool just to define the line where the angle changes. I want it to be crisp, a sharp corner rather than the two planes simply flowing into each other. Once the outer walls have been trimmed, I can begin to finish the bottom. I trim away this outer edge, leveling it to remove excess weight and to also create an edge that's less susceptible to being damaged as it's used moved, picked up, and put away. I then trim away all the wiring off marks before switching to a metal kidney, which I don't use the edge for, but in fact I'm pressing the flat section of the tool against the clay. This not only burnishes it, but it also compresses the clay, impacting any of those sharper specks of sand that are otherwise protruding. And finally, the base is impressed with my maker's mark. And then I set them aside on a wear board that's wiped very clean, as I don't want these freshly trimmed bases to pick up any specks of dirt or clay or be scratched. And it's for this reason, if I'm ever moving around leather hard work, I always pick it up and put it down. I never drag it, as doing so would just cause unnecessary damage to work you've carefully finished. As you can see, this mug is quite an undulation in the lower section, but with careful trimming, you can get rid of the worst of it. And ultimately, once the piece has been fired, you're never going to spin it like this, where slight wobbles or flaws become exaggerated. But by holding my hand very steady and trying to trim through the undulation as it spins around, it's quite remarkable how much you can fix a piece like this. To ensure segments are perfectly flat, I often just skim one of the edges of a metal tool like this over them, which burnishes the clay a little bit too, although on the sides of the pot, where glaze will eventually be, that isn't so much of a concern. I then remove the spinner, and again, you can sort of see the rough lines across the base that I'm trying to remove, and as I trim, you'll see that my left hand's fingers are firmly pressed down against the clay just to help stabilise not only the pot, but the tool too when it comes to turning the very centre. All this blowing you hear me do is simply to dislodge any burrs of clay left on the surface, which could otherwise be compressed back into the base, leaving a mark. Once the bevel is nice and flat, I use the pads of my fingers and thumb just to soften those edges ever so slightly. And then once again, my maker's mark is pressed in. Trimming these is a relatively fast process, so a small batch like this doesn't take long to get through. The important thing is catching the clay when it's at just the right consistency to trim, which is easier said than done. Once these have been trimmed, I can't attach their handles straight away, as the process of trimming away this outer layer reveals clay inside that's slightly softer, and the piece as a whole becomes slightly soft and flexible again, and attempting to attach their handles immediately would likely result in the pot itself deforming. So once this step has been completed, I'll leave them 
uncovered for a while, just to allow the outside surface to firm up once again. So much of making pottery is keeping an eye on the condition of the pots you're making. It's constantly on the back of my mind, and really it's a skill that can only be learnt through experience, as the rate to which things dry and how they do so will change depending on where you live, the studio you're working in, the type of clay, and all manner of other little variables. Once I'm done with my chuck, I wrap it back up with plastic tightly so that it can remain leather hard indefinitely. The next step is attaching the handles. Before I begin, I prepare three boards. So I have the one in the middle, which is simply where the pots are stored, a plastic lined one, which is where they'll go once the handles have been attached, and lastly an empty one, which is where the handle blanks will be placed as they're snipped off individually from the long length which I'm about to make. I take a piece of clay and I fashion it into a sort of droplet shape. I grasp the thicker end and then with a wet hand I begin to gradually pull the length ever longer and longer. I squeeze near the top where my fingers are gripping the block and with that squeeze maintained I pull throughout the entire length. You'll also notice that as I pull I continually change the sides at which my hand is pulling on the clay itself. If instead I was to only pull the clay from one side, the cross section would end up being uneven. So by changing the position of my hands every couple of pulls, it ensures that the cross section is perfectly even and oval. And this practice not only applies to this stage, but it must also be done when you're pulling the actual handle on the mug itself. One question often arises when I'm pulling handles like this, which is, why don't you just use an extruder? And here's why. I think in the time it would take you to load up the extruder, press out the clay, and clean it up, I could already have pulled many more lengths this way. Plus, there's virtually no cleanup involved other than wiping down the table at the end. Additionally, there are days where I have to pull handles for multiple different shapes and sizes of vessels. If I were using an extruder, I'd have to constantly change the die plate. Whereas with this method, all I have to do is squeeze the clay slightly harder or alter the shape of my hand. In this instance, my hand itself is the die plate and it's one that's infinitely adjustable and versatile. All of that isn't to say that extruding handles isn't a good method. It is. But ultimately, pottery is a craft where every single ceramicist has their own way of doing things. And often it just reflects the way you were taught. Once all the lengths have been separated into their individual blanks, I take a mug and I score and slip an outside portion. This creates a patch on the pot, which is slightly softer and combined with the slip, it should help this handle blank attach more securely. In preparation for joining the two together, I tap out one end of a handle blank, which creates a flare of clay that'll be easy to blend into the body of the mug. It's then pushed on with one hand kept inside, opposite of where that pressure is being applied, just to make sure it doesn't deform the internal structure of the mug. I then take the purposefully flared out section of clay and I blend it in all the way around. Initially this is done with a dry finger and I'm really just dragging away excess clay whilst making sure the join is absolutely sealed. And now the real pulling can begin. The process is much the same as it was when pulling the initial length, only this time I need to be far more careful as I pull the piece of clay to be much thinner and finer. Moreover, at this stage, if I do make any drastic mistakes, not only will it ruin the handle, but there's a good chance that the mug itself could be damaged too. Once thin enough, I tuck in the tip of my thumb and I score in these three grooves, which mostly helps just to thin it out considerably. And as I'll be carving these later on too, I'm not especially concerned about leaving perfectly smooth and even grooves. The length is then looped downward and pushed firmly 
into the lower section of the mug. I snip away the excess and then I smear the clay in either side and generally just spend a few moments neatening it up. At this stage, unless you're working with porcelain or something, I try not to touch the majority of the pooled length as fiddling with it will likely only deform it further. The only sections I'm really going to carve are around the top and a bit from the inside so I want that crisply pulled back section to remain like that. Then, once the bottom has been properly blended in, I just use a wetted finger just to fettle over any inconsistencies and to make it all smooth and even. Handles can be tricky things. Last week, I had 20 so attempts at pulling porcelain handles for the first time in a very long time, and the process made me feel like a beginner again. Grogged stoneware just has so much more strength, but I'll persist. After about 10 or so attempts, I had some really lovely ones, but I had to pull them in such a different way, as not only does the clay seem to have far less strength, it flows in a totally different way too, and it absorbs water in seconds, which means the handle length is constantly becoming too dry, which leads to it almost being ripped off. But I'll make a video about that learning experience soon. Once the handles have been attached, I wrap the mugs up tightly with plastic and seal both ends. This lets the handles dry out very slowly and it means the two components, one being the leather hard mug and the other the soft handle, have time to acclimatise to one another. And this is what prevents a majority of the cracks forming around the joints. I won't attempt to carve the handles for a few days. They need to be really properly dried out before I do that, otherwise there's a good chance I'll just destroy them, but they can't be bone dry. A knife still needs to be able to easily pierce the clay and flow through it. So a few days later, and now the mugs and handles are the exact same consistency throughout, which also means after they've been carved, I can dry them out a lot faster, as I don't have to worry about the two components drying at different rates. So here it is before, and essentially all I'm going to be doing when I'm carving these is removing some of the clay from this top join and from the underside, like so. This is a procedure I've only started to do recently, and by no means do I do it to all of my handled forms. Instead, I do it to those that I just want a little more delicacy from, as by carving them I can create handles that are much thinner than I could ever pull them initially. And look, this, more than anything, is just a matter of personal preference. Some prefer chunkier, thicker handles, whereas others, myself included, prefer those that are finer and more delicate. I think one thing I'm constantly trying to chase is a level of finesse in my work. I really like the idea of taking something which is simply mud and stone and turning it into a light, delicate object something that's worlds apart from the material it started off as. Once the handle has been trimmed, I use a sponge on a stick just to fettle over any marks or irregularities left on the surface. Then I just switch to using a wetted finger to run over these areas, compressing in any particles of sand that were exposed by the sponge. And again, just to tidy up the carved area, this process certainly adds a lot of time to the creation of each object, so going forward it will be something I only ever do to smaller batches of mugs. It won't be a process I use for my normal straight sided mugs, otherwise a batch of a hundred that takes me two days to throw, trim and handle could easily end up taking three. Equally though, I'm sure I would get faster with more practice, as this is still a relatively new process for me. And here's how they look before, so this is a piece that has not been carved, and here's the carved version. So visually, the difference isn't all that much, but it's certainly more noticeable when you hold it, and when you take into account that the handle still needs to have a layer of glaze applied to it that coats the entirety of it. That alone adds a few millimetres extra all the way around. And believe it or not, there still is one last step to do which is double checking the base and doing some quality control. 
Inevitably, when attaching and pulling the handle, some portion of the base will be scratched, or a tiny burr of clay will sink into the still relatively soft base. Likewise, when you attach the handle at the base, there's a chance that some runover will flow onto the beveled edge and the bottom. So this process, which only takes five minutes to do all of the mugs, really does make a big difference. I'm a stickler for pots with nicely finished bases. I've probably mentioned this before, but there's nothing worse than a piece that's well crafted all over, apart from the base, which has just been forgotten about. And that's it. The mugs are now more or less finished. For this stage, anyway, they still need to be bisque fired, glazed, and then gas fired up to 1290 degrees Celsius. And only then will I be left with a mug like this, which I think at this stage, it actually shows the finesse of the handle more clearly. And also the importance of having a well-defined line between the two angles in the body, because as the glaze is so thick, it can very easily just become hidden and lost. I then soak my chuck in water one last time, wrap it in plastic and store it away in a sealed plastic box. And then, like the end of every day, I just do a brief little tidy up of my wheel, which is by far the best thing about having your own studio, is that it doesn't matter if I leave a mess in my wheel or in the studio as a whole, as no one else is going to be working in here. But with that being said, I am also quite a clean potter. And that isn't to say that I clean a lot all the time. Rather, I tidy up little and often. At the end of every day, I quickly just mop around my wheel just to pick up all of the dust. And then I'd say every couple of weeks, I give the studio a more thorough clean. And then every couple of months, when it comes to organizing one of my online shop updates, I give the place a real blitz as I chuck down all of the cardboard boxes and all my other packaging materials from up on the mezzanine down into the studio. So I like the place to be spotless so that I don't package any dust or clay into the parcels that I send out into the world. That box, by the way, that I was storing my tools in is padded, mainly to protect any of my trimming tools that have tungsten carbide blades as if they roll onto the hard concrete floor. The blades will shatter and they're expensive things. I tend to have quite a lot of reclaim simply due to the amount I trim off my pots. Everything I make is very thin and light, which means I end up doing quite a lot of reclaim. And because of that, and this is actually the first time I've ever had this in any of the studios I've worked in, I keep my bucket of reclaim directly next to my wheel so I can just shovel in all these trimmings. As I'm throwing two, if any pieces of clay come off of my hands, I can simply chuck it straight into the bucket rather than letting it go into the wheel tray. Additionally, when it comes to scraping this slip away from my hands when I go to lift a pot off of the wheel, I can just do so on the lip of the bucket itself. And all of this probably sounds very obvious, but after years of working in studios where the reclaimed bucket was nowhere near my wheel, this simple setup is a revelation. And I have two on the go, one which is exclusively for stoneware and the other for porcelain. The only real issue is cleaning out the hose that drains from the wheel tray into the bucket, so don't even get me started on that. Anyhow, I think these subjects are sometimes interesting to hear about. They may not be involved with the actual creation of the objects, but they're procedures every single potter has to do, regardless. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.